Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. R.B. Shiflet writes this, The third chapter of Ephesians truly believed fully accepted and consistently applied to our Bible study would cure the church of the majority of its problems. Most doctrinal error stems from failing to see the distinctive ministry of Paul as the apostle to whom and through whom the ascended glorified Christ made known his plan and purpose concerning our position, our hope, and our calling as members of the church, which is his body. The revelation of the mystery is absolutely vital to a proper, consistent understanding of God's Word and reveals to us what God is doing today. Paul turns here to remind the Ephesians about his revelation, how Christ has revealed it to him, and how Christ wants us to make it known so that all might see it. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Paul says, for this cause, which points back to what Paul had just previously said about the formation of the body of Christ, about there being no difference between Jew and Gentile, how they are joined together in one new man with the Gentiles being made nigh by the blood of Christ and no more strangers and foreigners, but part of the family of God by faith. It not only points back to the immediate context, but the context of the whole book. As Paul says, for this reason, for the cause of God's grace being showered and unloaded on the Gentiles, I, Paul, am a prisoner on behalf of you Gentiles. Paul was in a Roman prison as he wrote the book of Ephesians, but he did not consider himself a prisoner of Rome, but a prisoner of Jesus Christ, a prisoner belonging to Christ. And he became Christ at his conversion on the Damascus Road. And he was a prisoner for you Gentiles, or on behalf of you Gentiles. Paul's imprisonment in Rome was because of his service to Christ as Christ's apostle to the Gentiles. Paul asked for prayer later in the book in chapter six, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And he says, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. In Colossians 4, 3, Paul asks for prayer again to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. What we find is that on account of his message, the mystery, and because of his ministry to the Gentiles as their apostle, he was in prison. His ministry and faithfulness to God's message for the Gentiles landed him in prison. Now had Paul preached and taught the law and prophecy and Jewish circumcision, he would have never been thrown into prison. But because of his unique message in ministry among the Gentiles that caused intense persecution by the Jews, Paul had been falsely accused in Jerusalem of bringing a Gentile into the temple, and he defended himself before a Jewish mob by giving his personal testimony. Paul, in that testimony, recounted how the Lord told him to go far hence to the Gentiles. Acts 22.22 22 then states, And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. This word, the word that infuriated the Jews, was the word Gentiles. Paul ended up in prison as a result of this and ultimately ended up in Rome. Paul's ministry and message to the Gentiles was why he ended up a prisoner. And this message is what Paul goes on to speak about here. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 2 through 3 say, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you heard, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Paul says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you heard. Notice that a dispensation 
and administration, a stewardship of God's grace, had been given to Paul directly. It does not say that it was given to me after it was given to the other apostles. To Paul alone and first was given the dispensation of grace. This means this dispensation and the church of today within that dispensation, the body of Christ, could not have begun until Paul. The term dispensation is the Greek word oikonomia, which means house law or house management. And the word has been defined this way, a stage in the progressive revelation of God constituting a distinct stewardship or rule of life. God's principles never change, but at different times and stages in history, his methods of dealings with mankind have changed when God dispensed to mankind a different and distinct rule of life. And to Paul, Christ revealed a dispensation of the grace of God, a dispensation based upon and which functions according to God's grace, where we are saved by grace, we are blessed by grace, and we live by grace. This dispensation was dispensed by God, given to Paul directly, who in turn dispensed and made it known to the Ephesians, to the Gentiles. Paul was the instrument whom God chose to reveal to and proclaim this glorious truth as the apostle of the nations. Paul says, by revelation, by direct divine revelation, Christ personally made known unto him the mystery. Since it was hid in God since the world began, it necessitated this, a direct revelation to reveal new truth to Paul. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip. After a good meal, they were exhausted, so they pitched their tent under the stars and went to sleep. Some hours later, Holmes awoke and nudged his faithful friend and said, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. And Dr. Watson replied, well, I see millions and millions of stars. What does that tell you, Holmes asked. And Dr. Watson pondered for a minute and he said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and billions of planets. Time-wise, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past 3 a.m. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and Lord of all, and that we are so very small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. But Holmes, what does it tell you? Holmes was silent for a minute, and then he said, Watson, you idiot, it means someone stole our tent. That mystery was pretty easy to solve by Sherlock Holmes, but the mystery Paul speaks of here has a different meaning than our normal understanding of a mystery. Paul speaks of the mystery three times here. The word mystery is the Greek word mysterion. It means a secret or to shut the mouth. It sounds like a term that a parent would use with their children sometimes. The term mystery, though, speaks of something God said nothing about until he revealed it to Paul. Dr. Leon Tucker explains the meaning of the word mystery this way. What is the mystery? It behooves us to be careful here, for it is possible to make the mystery a mystery. It is possible to cause to be concealed what God has revealed. Let us remember, the mystery is a revelation, not a riddle. It is something made known, not something covered up. It was hid in God, but is now manifest. In this mystery, there is nothing mystically mysterious. It is not referring to things secretly hidden within veils and surrounded with suspicion. The mystery of Ephesians is revealed plainly and particularly. The Greek word mysterion does not indicate the mysterious. It means something which is not known until shown, rather than something which is unknown. W. E. Vine says, In the ordinary sense, a mystery implies knowledge withheld. Its scripture significance is truth revealed. So the mystery is a body of truth in a dispensation that God had said nothing about in the past, but then he made it known and made it known fully. And to Paul alone was revealed the mystery, and the truths of the mystery of grace are found exclusively in Paul's letters. The instructions for this dispensation of grace, the rule of life under grace, and what God is doing today are found in the letters of Paul. 
the doctrine, position, walk, and destiny for the church of today, the body of Christ, are found in Paul's writings alone. William R. Newell put it very well where he says, Paul's letters constitute an independent and complete body of doctrine. They reveal not only God's method of salvation in this age, but also the true character, calling, and destiny of the church. We, of course, find principles, truths, and examples to live by outside of the letters of Paul. But God's direct commands and marching orders for the church today and how the church is to function and live was revealed directly and exclusively to Paul. Understanding that, and eliminates so much confusion. Because when one tries to apply God's word and mistakenly takes promises meant for the nation of Israel and truth and teaching about their tribulation period and living in the millennial kingdom, error and confusion reigns. So many blunderize the word of God, they just throw it all together and mix it all up. But God wants his plans for Israel and his plans for the body of Christ kept separate and to be understood literally. They are two different plans for two different groups of people, and they have different promises and different hopes. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute, but first we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Two Great Commissions is a 28-page booklet written by Pastor Kevin J. Sadler. This booklet presents the stark contrast between the Lord's commission to the Twelve Apostles and His commission to the Apostle Paul for the dispensation of grace in which we live. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750. That's 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.BereanBibleSociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.BereanBibleSociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. God has two programs, a program for Israel and a program for the body of Christ. God's program for Israel was a program with an earthly hope, which was revealed by the mouth of His holy prophets since the world began, as Acts 3.21 says. God's program for the body of Christ is a program with a heavenly hope, which was kept secret since the world began, but is now revealed, as we see here in Ephesians 3. In verse 3, Paul says that he wrote a four and few words of this mystery. And this refers, I believe, to the first part of this letter. And so as we go to the first part of this letter in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, we learn that the mystery involves Paul being called out and sent out by the will of God as a unique apostle for this dispensation. It says in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. The mystery reveals that the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, are dealing with this world in grace and peace, not in wrath and judgment, as we see in verse 2, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The mystery teaches that heaven is our hope, and we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ in heavenly places. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In verse 4 of chapter 1, the mystery shows us that the body of Christ and our blessings in Christ were not an afterthought of God, but a forethought of God. Before the creation of the world, God chose us. He chose that believers in the body of Christ should stand positionally holy and blameless before Him in love in heavenly places, as it says, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. In verse 5 of chapter 1, the mystery tells us that we are adopted or 
placed as full-grown sons, heirs in Christ, the moment that we believe, right up front. The mystery teaches that we who have trusted Christ as Savior are accepted in Him, redeemed, forgiven of our sins, and that we have a heavenly inheritance, as we see verses 5 through 7 and verse 11 of chapter 1. The mystery reveals that we are sealed and indwelt by the Spirit who guarantees our future resurrection and the redemption of our body at the rapture. Verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1 tells us, The mystery teaches us that Christ's inheritance is us, His saints, that He is heir to us all in the church, and His most precious and prized possession is the church. In Christ, we are dearer to the heart of God than all the splendors of creation, than anything. It tells us that we have the resurrection, life, and power of Christ within us. The mystery reveals Christ in all His glory and exaltation far above all things, with all things under His feet, that He is the head of the church, the body of Christ, who fills all in all, filling all all the body and all ways, giving us everything we need in every way, verses 20 through 23 teaches us in chapter 1. The mystery tells us that we are exalted in Christ and given a position in the heavenlies in Him. Chapter 2, verse 6 says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. The mystery reveals how we become members of the body of Christ, the true church today, that it's by grace through faith not of works, lest any man should boast, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The mystery tells us that Gentiles, that we are saved apart from the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants of promise and are made nigh to God by the precious blood of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The mystery tells us that the law, the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has been removed by the cross. That there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The enmity is removed. We lose our identity in Christ and we are one in Him. And being saved, we are now members of God's new creation, the one new man, the church, the body of Christ. Verses 14 through 16 teach us these things in chapter 2. And the mystery instructs us in the body of Christ that we have free access to God the Father through Christ by one Spirit. Verse 19 teaches that we are fellow citizens. We are citizens of heaven and part of the family of God. And we are a holy temple of God and a habitation of the Spirit as we learn in verses 21 through 22. That's just what Paul wrote for in a few words in this book. Now, there's more to the mystery revealed in the rest of Paul's letters, too. But understanding the mystery is the key to understanding your Bible. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4 says, Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul says in verse 4 that when we read this letter, we gain an understanding of his knowledge or insight into the mystery of Christ. But notice how Paul calls it the mystery of Christ. It is the mystery, God's church truth for today, belonging to Christ. At its center, the focal point of the mystery is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the church's foundation. He is the church's life. He is the church's hope. And he is the church's power. The church is a living organism. And we are joined to our living risen, exalted head. And as it's been said, the church is totally dependent upon Him for its beginning, its continuance, and its future. And Christ's sacrifice, His shed blood, His cross, is at the very center, the core of the revelation of the mystery as it extols and explains all the glorious accomplishments of the cross. The wonderful thing about having an understanding of the mystery is that it helps us to know the Son. It helps us to know our Savior better and to grow deeper in Him. We are transformed by grace as we grow in Christ. And we grow deeper in Christ as we understand what He's doing right now, today, 
in this current dispensation of grace and what he's doing in his heavenly ministry today. We should strive to know everything there is to know about our Savior, including his earthly ministry. But we must remember that when we are in the Gospels, that his earthly ministry was carried out according to his earthly plans and program for the nation of Israel and making her a blessing and a light to the world. But God's plan changed. He temporarily set Israel aside in unbelief. Today, we are under grace. This was first revealed to the Apostle Paul. To know Christ according to, do, to, according to what he's doing right now in this dispensation of grace, we need to know the mystery. We need to know the revelation Christ gave to Paul found in his epistles. As we do so, we grow in knowing our Savior even deeper according to his heavenly ministry. We learn of his will for my life right now. We learn of our heavenly plans and his heavenly hope and future he has for us, the church, the body of Christ. Ephesians 3 verses 5 to 6 say, Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Paul says in verse 5 that the mystery was not made known in other ages unto the sons of men. God's truth that he revealed to Paul is nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. It is not in the four gospels. It was not given to the twelve. He was shown things the twelve apostles never knew, never heard of. This revelation was a real revelation. It was a mystery, but no longer. Paul says it is now revealed. A mystery lover took his place in the theater for opening night, but his seat it was way back in the theater, far from the stage. The man called an usher over and whispered, I just love a good mystery, and I've been anxiously anticipating the opening of this play. However, in order to carefully follow the clues and fully enjoy the play, I have to watch a mystery close up. Look how far away I am. If you can get me a better seat, I'll give you a handsome tip. The usher nodded and said he'd be back shortly. Looking forward to this large tip, the usher spoke with his co-workers in the box office, hoping to find some closer tickets. With just three minutes left until the curtain, he found an unused ticket at the will call window, snatched it up. Returning to the man in the back of the theater, he whispered, follow me. The usher led the man down to the second row and proudly pointed out the empty seat right in the middle. Thank you so much, said the theater goer. This seat is perfect. And then he put a quarter in the usher's hand. The usher looked down at the quarter, leaned over and whispered, the butler did it in the parlor with the candlestick. And the mystery was revealed. As the revelation of the mystery has been made known and revealed, so it should be made known and now revealed to all people. It is a message of Christ and His grace in providing salvation for all people and an offering of reconciliation to God for anyone through, his, through Christ's sacrifice on their behalf. For that reason alone, it should be made known worldwide. It's, it's the best news ever made known. Paul says this message has been now revealed to God's holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now that sometimes can trip people up thinking that Paul's talking about the 12 apostles, but he's not talking about the 12 apostles here at all. He's talking about the apostles and prophets of grace in their foundational ministry before the completion of the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, just a few verses earlier, speaks of how the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Apostles and prophets in the dispensation of grace had a foundational ministry to the body of Christ and for the beginning of this dispensation. We even see the gifts of apostles and prophets in chapter 4, verse 11, that were still in effect at that time. Without God's word being completed, these gifts and gifted men were necessary for the early church for the Holy Spirit to supernaturally reveal and declare God's will and the new message of the revelation of the mystery to the body of Christ. Paul received his message from the Lord Jesus Christ. These holy apostles and prophets received it through the Holy Spirit. And these holy apostles and prophets are 
holy apostles and prophets of grace who preached Christ according to his heavenly ministry, laid the foundation of Christ for the dispensation of grace according to the mystery, and simply they were just Paul's fellow laborers, men such as Silas and Timothy. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.6, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. And in the first part of that book, those men are identified as Paul, Silas, and Timothy. These were foundational gifts for the church. Once that foundation was laid, Scripture was completed, these gifts fulfilled their purpose and ceased. But not back then when Paul wrote this. Paul in verse 6 tells us again that the mystery unfolds to us the truth of the body of Christ and that God is taking believing Gentiles and believing Jews and forming a church, the body of Christ, where we are all one in Christ. No longer does the Gentile need to come through the Jew to be saved like in time past. God is not working through one nation Israel to reach all the other nations like he did in the past. Today, he offers salvation to all people individually by grace through faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. In this body, Jew and Gentile, we share jointly in the blessings of God's grace. Gentiles are fellow heirs or joint heirs, literally, and of the same body or of the joint body and are partakers or joint partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. Those are important words in verse 6. It doesn't say by the covenants of promise. This is mystery truth. That Jew and Gentile are one in Christ, joint heirs of a joint body, being joint partakers of his promise of eternal life by the gospel of the grace of God. This dispensation of grace and the revelation of the mystery was never predicted, never prophesied, never seen by the prophets in the Old Testament. The salvation of Gentiles is absolutely, that was not a mystery. That was spoken of and clearly prophesied in the Old Testament. But their salvation in that program was always through Israel's rise. The salvation of Gentiles through Israel's fall, in spite of Israel, apart from Israel, by grace through faith alone in Christ, becoming joint heirs and equal members of a church called the body of Christ, you will not find that outside of Paul's letters. That was absolutely and totally unheard of and unknown until Paul. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.